Welcome everyone to the Pack Walkers Virtual Summit. Very excited for another week of lectures with you all. We have a very special speaker today. We have Ashley from A Fetch and Good Time. She's out in Joshua Tree. She's going to be talking to us about mindful adoptions today. So without further ado, I'm going to give it over to Ashley and let her begin. All right. Hi, you guys. Welcome. Um, okay, so I guess I'll just kind of give a small, small introduction of me. Um, I'm Ashley with the Fetching Good Time. Um, how I got started in my training journey is um, I started at a doggy daycare and just kind of things kind of took off from there. I became super fascinated with the dog world, how dogs have conversations with each other. And it just kind of really consumed me at that point. So uh, where I was working, I just kind of took advantage of um, the people around me and the dogs I had in front of me to kind of learn all that I could about it. And then time came that I had to um, move on from that job due to a move. And I didn't want to stop working with dogs. So I thought, hey, why don't I just kind of give this a whirl? And and here I am. Um, it'll be actually three years in July that I've been open as my own business. So um, that's just a little bit about me. So my topic is mindful adoptions, right? So generally, when we think about that, the first thing that most trainers are trying to educate people on is, you know, does this dog fit your lifestyle? That's important. <laughs> Because if you're not active, you probably should not have a dog that requires you to be. Um, in my opinion, I don't think that that's fair. <laughs> if you don't like running and jogging and being super active, let's not get a dog that kind of requires that physical activity. Um, so somewhere along the lines, we kind of got it, you know, in our heads that dogs just need a bed and couch cuddles, food um, and a yard to be happy. Um, and we've really kind of strayed away, like far away from things that they actually need and actually require as the dogs that they are. Um, so with that, not even a yard will fulfill your dog. Um, while I think it's important to consider all those things, we really kind of need to ask ourselves, like, why are we adopting this dog? Have we given it an appropriate amount of thought? Are we actually in a place in our life to really kind of take this on? Um, dogs are a commitment. Dogs require specific things. It's a living creature, right? Um, so what I'm really trying to get people to focus on is this is more about this end of the leash versus the dog you're going to adopt, right? So like I said, of course, it's important to really consider what your lifestyle is to match with the breed. Uh, but I really want people to kind of start turning inwards and asking themselves specific questions, right? Um, like, where are you in your personal life right now? Do you have job stability? What's your housing situation? What kind of time and effort can you invest into this dog? Um, are there other animals in your home, <laughs> other people in your home? Um, are you able to take this dog when you move? That's a lot that um, I see, um, especially working with the shelter is, hey, we're moving. I'm moving to a place that doesn't accept animals, right? So these are all kind of things that I think should be thought of we need to kind of look down, down the future line. Um, and then are you able to be dedicated to fulfilling this dog and its biological requirements, right? Are we going to walk it? How are we going to socialize it? What's its diet going to look like? Um, those are all very equally important things that kind of can, you know, cause problem behaviors if, if we're not doing those in an appropriate manner for that kind of dog. Um, you know, kind of ask yourself, are you in a place to be disciplined with something new? Um, I personally think it requires a lot of discipline to have a dog and to add something like that to your life. I want to know, like, do you set healthy boundaries and other relationships with your life? Because dogs require boundaries. So if you're maybe somebody who 
struggles setting those boundaries in other areas of your life, you could potentially struggle setting boundaries with your dog and dogs absolutely need boundaries. Um, it's, it's absolutely important. Otherwise, again, you, you can just run yourself into a world of behavioral problems. Um, so also leading into that, how do you set boundaries with others? Are they loud? Are you soft in it? Are they non-existent? And are they actually received by the other person? Can you be believable when you are setting these boundaries? Um, and then how how do you respond when other people don't respect your boundaries? I think that's also a huge thing because dogs are opportunists and they're also going to kind of <laughs> test those boundaries that you're setting. Um, so does, fr does frustration show up when your boundaries aren't being received by others, right? Kind of looking inside to your internal triggers when things like that are happening. Um, let's see. I also think that it's really important that you approach things with an open mind and that you have to be open-minded enough to educate yourself on the requirements that it takes to kind of nurture your relationship with your dog. Um, coming in with a closed-minded approach is really going to limit the amount of education you can receive, the amount of help and assistance and support that you can receive, I feel like. So if you aren't necessarily an open-minded person, you can really kind of end up closing yourself off and sitting in this bubble of trouble because you're not open-minded enough to look at different approaches, listen to other people's ideas, take what you love, leave what you don't, and kind of seek out the support that you need if you are running into these problems with your dog. Um, really a big one that I'd really like people to really start asking is what value are you trying to bring to your life with this dog right um a lot of people are like oh i want a dog because it's cute or i want a dog for um, my child to grow up with and i'm not saying there's no right or wrong reason but i think if we really kind of start looking at what kind of value is this dog supposed to be adding to my lifestyle then you can kind of you can kind of have a better understanding of what you want that lifestyle to look like therefore you can start navigating those boundaries sooner rather than after the behavioral problems start coming if that kind of makes a little bit of sense there um so i really think it's important like what what value are you adding to your life with this dog um because if the dog isn't if you get the dog and the dog isn't adding that value to your life, I your mental health can drastically start to go down the hill. I have seen it in many clients that have reactive dogs um, or are experiencing massive, you know, destructive behavioral problems inside of the home. And in my opinion, that dog is not adding value. That dog has just added stress, um, extra finances just a whole whirlwind of problems and that's really that's gonna hurt your relationship that's not nurturing your relationship with your dog that's really you're gonna end up um maybe resenting your dog maybe having negative feeling towards your dog and your dog feels that your dog can absolutely feel that if that is the energy that has started to shift inside of the home um so then that brings me to kind of asking, um, what is that life going to look like for you and the dog, right? So again, that's kind of playing into if you're an active person and you um, you bike ride, you ski, you go out on the boat, stuff like that, getting a dog that can kind of match that lifestyle and keep up with that activity is perfect. Um like a, like a really good kind of match for you, right? So it's, what do you want that life to look like with your dog? Um, I also think it's important to kind of ask yourself, are you generally an anxious person? Now, I'm not saying anxious people can't have a dog, but being mindful that that transfers to the energy in the room, dogs pick up on that, especially if you're holding their leash. So if you're somebody who 
gets anxious when you go to crowds and you're trying to take your dog out to these crowds, your dog is going to feel that and there they could potentially start to become anxious about that environment themselves just by simply feeding off of your energy. Um, so, and, you know, not saying again, <laughs> an anxious person can't have a dog, but it's really kind of something that we need to, to be aware of, um, especially when we're trying to take our dogs to places. Um, yeah, I think people should kind of also ask themselves, like, can you recognize triggers in yourself? So again, it's like if the farmer's market kind of triggers you with anxiety, how can you regulate your anxiety so that it's not transferring to your dog so you and your dog can actually enjoy the farmer's market together um, or enjoy those activities that you're trying to do together? Um, I think that's super important, being able to recognize specific triggers in yourself so that you can regulate that and make sure that you're not transferring that down the leash to your dog. And that kind of also plays a little bit into, um, like, do you work on ways to regulate your own nervous system? So are you filling into your own cup? Because that is really important. If you're not filling into your own cup and doing things that really kind of put passion back into your life or uh, really kind of just get you pumped up to walk your dog in the morning or come home and spend time with them and play that tug in the yard. If you're not, if you're not fulfilling yourself, you have nothing to give to your dog, to your partner, to your clients, to anybody else as well. So not doing things to regulate your own nervous system and fill your own cup. Again, you're, your dog is going to pay the price a little bit for that um, because you're not going to want to get up and walk them because you're too tired because you're not doing anything for yourself. I myself have absolutely fell into that trap of, you know, being so busy and being here and let me help everybody and, you know, trying to do everything at once. And then it's like, oh, well, when was the last time I went to yoga? When was the last time I went on a run? When was the last time I just went on a walk without a dog? When was the last time I woke up with my cup of coffee and just enjoyed the sunrise before even getting my dogs out? So I used to, my alarm clock would go off in the morning and Butters would, he would hear that alarm and he'd instantly start like punching that kennel door. And it became a trigger to me of like, oh my gosh, I have to get right up and I need to let him out. But then that really started my day off on such a foul note because I didn't take my time. I wasn't slowing myself down in the morning. He could wait. He could absolutely wait two minutes for me to wake up, go make my cup of coffee, you know, say hello to the kitty cats and then go in and get him. Right. But I really had this, oh, this need that he needs it right now, this sense of urgency. And by creating that sense of urgency in myself, I fell right into this like super fast paced life. And when we're running and running and running and running, we have no time to slow down. We have no time to actually take things in. And I could become a little bit more reactive myself, right? A little bit more snippy that day. Um, and it's not doing him any good. It's not slowing butters down either. And he's a dog that is extremely, or was extremely anxious. Um, had a lot of separation anxiety and could really use me slowing myself down to be able to transfer that down the leash to slow his mind down so that he could actually start to take in life at the slower pace a little bit. So again, I, and I tell my clients this all the time, the most work that you're ever going to do in training your dog is right here, right here on the human end. Um, it's super important that you're pouring into your cup and making sure that you are slowing down and not in a rush with your dog. Um, yeah. Um, I really think the next thing too is, do you have the finances to invest in the resources for this dog? I'm not talking toys and things that the billion dollar pet industry has made you believe that your dog needs. I'm talking about a dog walker because you're gone for 10 hours a day at work, a trainer because your dog is having behavioral issues, vet bills because emergencies happen, vaccines are 
absolutely necessary. And seriously, for the love of God, please get your pet fixed. <laughs> Stop breeding dogs in your backyard and putting them up on Facebook and Craigslist and, and accidental litters. Just get your dog fixed. Like if you if if you don't even have the money to pay for that. I think we need to revisit again, why are we adopting this dog in the first place? Um, because I see that a lot. We, again, we're adopting these dogs and we're going, oh, we need to go get a bed. We need to go get a bucket of toys. The dog needs this. The dog needs a million treats. And the pet industry has done a wonderful job at marketing that to you. Really, they, they do a fabulous job at marketing all of these cutesy little things, thinking you need the stroller for your dog. You need... Um, a whole closet full of toys. You need to have a subscription toy box every month for them because they're just, you know, destroying toys that do nothing really for their enrichment, in my opinion. Um, so they really, when you break it down in the pet industry and you're actually looking at it, um, training doesn't even hit in like the top 10. And to me, I really think um, training should almost kind of be number one. Even if you feel like you have a really good, like, oh, yeah, I know what I'm doing. If it's your first time getting a dog, if you hadn't had a puppy in a long time, if you're rescuing a dog, I do think it. there's a lot of value in setting up a consultation or even just reaching out to a trainer so that you already kind of have that in your back pocket. But for some reason, training just, it just doesn't exist in that billion dollar pet industry because they don't make any money off of it it's totally separate they make money off of pushing the toys and your dog needs this and your dog needs that um so fi finances are are a really big thing for me um and that was that was my when I decided to add bear to my pack I had thought about it for an extremely long time about okay am I in this place to adopt a dog can I add to my pack right now? Do I have that time? Do I have the education? And I did, I had all of that now. Um, my, my one hard, like, mm, was, can I financially take on this dog where I'm at in my personal life? Right. Can I afford his food? Can I afford those vaccines? What happens if he does get an emergency, um, needs an emergency vet visit? So having something like pet insurance or care credit, um, those can be extremely valuable to kind of help give you that little bit of buffer for those what if moments. And you might not have that $500 just for that emergency vet visit, but you kind of have that you know, helper back up on the side so that if that does happen, you have a plan in place to help get you over that hump is kind of how I think about it. Um, and again, like if you're going to be gone for 10 hours a day, five days a week, I'm not saying don't get a dog, but you need to think about how you're going to be fulfilling that dog when you're gone. What is fair to that dog? So yeah, you're going to hire a pack walker. Um, you're going to be coming home on your lunches to let that dog out. Uh, at least that's what I'm advising my clients that we need to do because it's not fair to get a dog and then kind of not be home all day for it. Again, what value is that dog adding to your life? Why did you get the dog if, if, if we're not doing things like that for the dog? Because having it just sit in your yard, um, get a fish, <laughs> get a fish, I think. Um, so let's see, um, are you ready to be dedicated to fulfilling this dog beyond couch cuddles and baby talk? Um, at the end of the day, this is a dog, not a human child. And it definitely has biological, biological requirements that if left unfulfilled can cause a mental toll on you as the human. Again, I've had many clients express how bad their mental health is because of their dog's reactivity. Um, one of my very first clients out here, she has an extremely reactive Frenchie, or I should say had, which the, the dog is still, <laughs> still with us. The reactivity has come down severely since she has found me. And her life was literally, her mental health got so bad, she 
she had just kind of come to this place of like, I'm never going to take this dog outside. We're never going to go anywhere. We can't do anything like, and she had had this vision of when she adopted this dog, I want to be able to go places with it. I want to take it to the shopping centers that I can. I want to take it traveling. I want to take it here. I want to take it there. Right. So she definitely had this vision of wanting to have this little buddy to take with her and got a dog that matches her activity level um, and dedicated time when she first got it to take off time at work to to be home with it um, right up front to be spending time bonding with it and everything and even hired um, she even had when she returned to work had it set up so the dog was going to some kind of daycare so that it wasn't sitting at home in a kennel all day um, but the dog's reactivity ended up growing inside of that daycare and um and it became so bad that she could not manage it outside of her home. It got bad inside of her home. And then she found me and we just really kind of, she's, she's on a whole other level with her dog. She's taking it out in public places and she actually has the confidence to handle her dog's moments if they are big or if they, if she is having an oopsie moment. Um, so I do think that that is super important that we're, not just thinking again, dogs just need some couch cuddles and some baby talk a little bit here. And then I think this is also super important because um, I think this is something that I am guilty of. <laughs> um, are you avoiding working on yourself and projecting that onto saving a dog because it needs a home? Um, I definitely was. So I think like eight, years ago, however long ago, I found Butters. Um, he was a three month old puppy who was just wandering through the desert basically. And, um, so I corralled him up, took him over to palms and paws, had him scanned. He had no microchip and they're like, Hey, you can surrender him if you want. We'll kind of take care of it from there. Mind you, I already had two dogs at the time. And I was like, oh, no, I could never surrender him to a shelter. That's not the life for him. I will I will be his mommy now. And um, like I can I can, you know, take this on. And so Butters came to live with me and I did things very differently with Butters. I focused on teaching him sit, shake down, you know, play dead and um, like a puppy play group. So the highlight of his day was going to play with other dogs. I did not focus on kid. He walk on a leash. He had never been in a car. Um, you know, I desperately just wanted to put like hands on affection on him. And he was a dog that's like, I don't like that. Like, I do not like that. And I'm trying to force it upon him. Um, so I did things extremely differently with him. And when it came time for us to move, to Hawaii with him and I never never used a kennel okay um so when it came time to move to Hawaii with him I put this poor dog in a kennel and put him on an airplane and he was stressed to the max and then we get over to Hawaii he's still super stressed to the max and everything just built from there his reactivity built his separation anxiety got worse um and it didn't dawn on me how unhealthy our relationship was until I landed the job at the doggy daycare. And I started looking at dogs and their behavior and realizing, wow, dogs can be anxious. Um, wow, it's actually really important for dogs to get walked, right? So once I kind of got clicked of how unhealthy my relationship was with Butters and how I needed to focus on other things with him and actually helping him find calm and fulfilling him as a dog. Um, that's where I really kind of dove into the training. I started training him and, and starting to fill, fulfill him as the dog that he was. So that's, I think that that's really important to, to think about. I kind of, and obviously back then in my personal life, um, I wasn't doing the work on myself. So I myself had a lot of anxiety, was still living that super fast paced life. And it just kind of also transferred to butters a little bit. And instead of working on myself, I was like, oh, I'll just adopt this dog and carry on with life. Um, 
yeah, that's definitely something I will not do anymore. I think also, um, do you currently have other animals in the home? I think that's something really important to think about because we tend to think, oh, it's a dog, so it's going to like this dog. That's not the case. Um, sometimes it works out. Sometimes it kind of, you know, sometimes we have problems. So I think it's super important that if you have other animals in the home, you're kind of asking, like, how do they feel about this new family member? Right. Um, so that's important to kind of have somewhat of an understanding of dog's body language so that you can show up for your first dog and you can show up for the new addition. So that's kind of like, how will you show up for your first dog? Right. When I brought bear home, I made sure that I was advocating for butters and keeping bear out of his face, keeping bear from being rude to him so that butters could be at a neutral place with him and bear could learn that's not what we do <laughs> with dogs that's a great way to either get bit or piss off another dog um the, you know a, the wrong dog could definitely react differently um so i also think it's important like how will you show up for your first dog you still have to fulfill that first dog and you have to fulfill that second dog and while we think they can kind of fulfill each other or meet each other's needs, that's really kind of not the case. Your new dog still needs you to teach it everything, how to walk on a leash, how to um, appropriately interact with the other people in your home, other animals in your home. So I think that that's really important that you don't just throw them out in the yard and say, well, they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, I don't ever condone that to my clients. Um, uh, this is something that I also see a lot is, are you getting a dog for your dog because you think your dog needs a dog? It doesn't, your dog does not need a dog. Your dog needs you to be doing the things with it. Your dog still needs you to show up for it. It needs you to walk it, to play with it to fulfill it still. Um, and I think anything past that, in my opinion, is a bonus. Um, like if like Bear and Butters, when they wanted to play, I was like, cool, that's really cool that you guys want to do that. That's awesome. But they still got fulfilled completely separately. Um, and then they could be brought together to be walked and stuff at the same time. Um, so a second dog will never fulfill your first dog, in my opinion. Um, I think it's also super important that we're thinking about like, what's your approach for introducing this new dog to your other one or other animals in the home? Um, again, I'm not all about just let's throw them in the yard and let them kind of figure it out. While I do think it's important that dogs have conversations, um, I think it's equally important that you are there first to be guiding these interactions so that you can be advocating appropriately for each dog because you're reading how each dog is feeling about one another when in the presence of each other. Um, I also think people should take into, kind of, take into consideration, what's the energy like in your home? Do you have lots of kids running around? Is it loud? Is it chaotic? Do you live a calm lifestyle? Um, all those things can kind of play into, again, your dog's energy and, and their state of mind. So if you have a lot of kids running around the home and you get a healer, <laughs> she's going to want to round them up. So I energy level and the kind of dog you get is kind of, kind of, ties in a little bit together to to be mindful of that because your dog is going to match that energy unless you teach it to be neutral in that same energy um so if you have lots of kids running around it's probably good practice to have that you know um cattle dog on a leash so that you can kind of help work it down so that it's not trying to chase your kids and corral them up. I also think you should think about like, do you travel a lot? 
if you travel a lot, are you taking that dog with you? Do you have somebody that can watch that dog for you? Do you have a place where they can be boarded? Because that also plays into your finances a little bit. Are you a hermit? If you're a hermit and you never go out, that's, you know, your dog is going to not necessarily be exposed as much to the world. So when you do go out, your dog could be having some feelings about it, right? Again, Butters was never exposed to the world. So when I started to try to take him out, I'm like, what's your problem, dude? Like, I don't understand. I'm just trying to go for a walk with you. What's what's wrong? Um, he had no idea about the outside world. The only thing he knew was, hey, let's go play with dogs. Dogs are fun. Um, are you easygoing? Do you live a really fast paced lifestyle? You know, do you work from home? Because if you do, how are you going to ensure that this dog will be okay when you leave, right? We don't want the dog having separation anxiety. I think it's really fair that if we are home all the time and we're just constantly having our dogs with us and unloading all of this attention and affection with them, and then we leave, did we set the dog up for success when we leave so that they have a calm, safe place to be and they're not, you know, going mentally insane because they can't find their person? Um, also, yeah, if you're, if you're never home, you might not want to get a dog. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you take care of your own emotional needs? Um, are you trying to have a dog be an emotional support animal? That's a huge thing. I see this a lot. We, we want this dog to be our emotional support animal, but the dog doesn't have the right temperament for it. Um, that's really key to that because, Butters could never be an emotional support dog. So if I'm just trying to unload all of my feelings or I'm crying and I want to cuddle him, that's really not good for him. Bear, on the other hand, he can kind of handle a little bit more of those emotions. He'll actually kind of, he will naturally come give me some comfort in those times. So not every dog can be an emotional support animal. And I think that we kind of, need to stop relying on animals to be that for us. And we need to really become that for ourselves or find a friend or a therapist or a partner who can hold that space for us. Uh, because from what I see nine times out of 10, I don't think it's really fair for, for the dogs that we're trying to make be uh, like, emotional support animals if if this dog is anxious and you're trying to if your dog is already super anxious and you're trying to have it be your emotional support animal I don't think that's really fair um so it kind of kind of plays into as Rachel said in her lecture are you seeking out instability and filling your life with it because if you are <laughs> You're not doing that work on yourself. And again, you're just giving, 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 and you really have nothing to give. And instead, you need to be overflowing your cup with things that are stable and helpful so that you can pour that out onto your dog and into the rest of your life. Um, let's see. So with all that said, I'm not saying if you're an anxious person, don't get a dog. If you're not that active, don't get a dog. If you work long hours, don't get a dog. That's not what I'm saying. What I am trying to say is that we need to become more self-aware in the way we live our lives because our dogs are our mirrors and they will show you what needs to be worked on. And nine times out of 10, that work needs to be done on the other side of the leash and not on the dog's end. So if you're not an active if you're not active, a Husky is not really going to be a good fit for your lifestyle. Neither is a Belgian Malinois. I said that weird. Um, so how are you going to ensure that this dog is getting what it needs? Um, yeah, that's kind of all that I've got for you. <laughs> so hopefully that's, um, yeah, the whole, the whole point was really to just kind of open, open up your eyes onto this end of the leash and kind of you know, that it, it takes, you got to be open-minded to really start thinking about it and um, start reflecting on yourself because, um, yeah, the, the more work you do here, the better your relationship is going to be with your dog, regardless of what behavioral problems you start running into. 
And that's why, again, you have to really think, do you, are you open-minded enough to even reach out and get help for, for this dog? Um, yeah, that's what I've got. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. Um, we're starting to get some questions here in the chat, and I'm going to go ahead and set it. If you want to unmute them yourself to ask a question, you can feel free, but I will ask this one from Colleen. Can you touch a little on the decompression side of bringing home a new dog from a shelter? Ah, uh, so yeah. So oftentimes we bring a dog home and again, we really want to go at this fast pace with it. Like here's the dog, here's the baby putting it in its face. And my approach, and again, how I advise my clients and the people who are coming to the shelter to bring home a second dog is take your time. If you're going to have that dog forever is, you know, the mindset, um, give that dog time to decompress, right? Dogs need, um, I think it's like three months to kind of learn your schedule, actually kind of release all that from where they've been and kind of actually start to get comfortable inside of your home. So stop rushing it, right? When I bring an animal into the home here for a board and train, or if it's coming to stay with us, um, it's not, Hey, let's go out into the yard. Hey, let's, you know, walk right up to my dogs and everything. That dog actually decompresses by itself. I start with a walk with it. Um, I take my time bonding with it. And then that dog comes into the home I put that dog into its kennel. I bring my dogs out and away from that dog. So, or if it can be in the separate room so that it can have time to decompress inside the home. That dog doesn't need to see the dogs outside of the kennel or go up and sniff the dog right away, or even your baby. It already smells it. It, it smells it in my backyard before they come in. So I do think it's really important to take your time when integrating and absolutely give Give that dog time to decompress if that's what that dog is showing you that it needs. So if you do have a super anxious dog, um, a very nerve nervous dog coming home from the shelter, yeah, stop putting pressure on it because that is pressure. And if you just let it hang out, put it even put it on the leash next to you and let it just sit with you in your office, you know, in in your bedroom and keep all the animals away from it. Because um, it already smells those animals. It does not need this either <laughs> from everybody coming into your home. Uh, give it that time. And then that dog can understand this is a safe environment. And, and the dogs actually kind of start to get curious and kind of start to loosen up a little bit. So take your time. There's no rush. I can't see the chat. Just so oh, you know. I too. sorry. Uh Jesse said, that was so awesome. I wish more potential adopters would think of these things. I'm going to send oh, this replay go. to all our local rescues and trainers. Thanks for taking the time uh -huh. to talk about all of this. Nata said, that was awesome. I think this lecture should be played in every shelter group for people adopt a dog. Colleen says, thank you. This was great. Oh, you guys are so sweet. Yeah, kind of a kind of a out there topic. But again, it's really playing into what's happening in my personal life. I'm doing a lot of work at the shelter. And the whole purpose of that is one, obviously, getting in there and um, lending that support to the dogs. But really, my whole goal is to kind of be there to start these mindful adoptions. Yes, we want dogs to go to homes, but I don't want dogs to just go to a home. I want them to go to the home because that gives them more adoptability and a less chance that they're going to be returned, returned, returned. Right. Uh, I'm glad that um, you guys enjoyed it. Brenda says, thank you. And we have some more room. If there's any more questions, now would be the time. Going once, going twice. <laughs> all right everyone thank you so much andrew says great job thanks for everyone for coming thanks ashley for giving us your time today giving this very valuable lecture about mindful adoptions hope you all have a great rest of the night take care everybody